Fabian of the Yard. Stories of the war against crime as told by the detective of the century, ex-superintendent Robert Fabian. Here is another true crime detection story drawn from the personal records of ex-detective Superintendent Fabian of Scotland Yard. I remember seeing some years ago a motion picture in which the leading character was a gangster who was a hero to the youngsters of his neighborhood. At the end of the film, the gangster who had sworn to show no fear in the face of death was persuaded to pretend to lose his nerve and scream for mercy on his way to the electric chair, the result being that he was no longer a hero to the children. The note struck was not entirely a bad one, because it certainly is unfortunate that so many youngsters are built up through, uh, or gangsters rather, are built up through fiction as heroes. But in point of fact, there is no such thing as an heroic gangster. And indeed, if the public only knew of the tragic end most crooks come to, there would be far less glamorizing of crime and its unusually bad effect on the minds of young people. In a moment, you're going to hear a story that will show you something of what I mean. The story of the man who escaped from hell. It was 1928. And although Robert Fabian had passed his examination for Detective Sergeant three years before, they hadn't yet promoted him. He was spending his leisure hours prowling the foyers of London hotels, seeking crime. He became interested in the behavior of a white-haired old man who was acting furtively whilst pretending to read a newspaper. From behind a potted palm, probably appearing no less furtive than the old man, the detective watched him as he got up from his seat and picked up an expensive-looking suitcase belonging to a guest and moved it over near his seat. A prosperous-looking man came seeking the suitcase, casting angry looks around the vestibule. The old man lowered his newspaper as the man approached and indicated the suitcase which the owner promptly claimed. In a few minutes, the old man had done the same thing again, this time with a pigskin traveling bag, and this led to the same result. He had two more attempts before Detective Fabian accosted him. Oh, come on, Dad. You want to give up crime before it becomes a habit. Eh? What's up? You've been making several attempts to steal somebody's suitcase. And obviously, you were going to keep trying until you happened to pick up a bag nobody claimed. It's just about the clumsiest method of stealing anything I've ever come across. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not doing anything. Why can't you leave a man alone? I'm arresting you on a charge of lodging with intent to steal. I'm sorry, old chap. But it's as much for your own good as anything else. Fabian took the old man's thin arm as gently as he could and escorted him to Vine Street Police Station. When they walked in, the station sergeant's eyes widened with surprise. Hello. What's he been doing? Lodging with intent, Sarge. Why, do you know him? <laughs> I thought everybody in the force knew him. That's Eddie Guerin you've got there, my boy. Guerin? Not the Eddie Guerin. <laughs> That's right. A man who escaped from Devil's Island. Good Lord. The amazement in Fabian's voice was profound, for like most people, he'd heard of the famous case of Eddie Guerin, who had robbed the American Express Company's offices in Paris and taken 40,000 pounds from the safe. He was sentenced to life imprisonment and shipped to Devil's Island. The tale of his escape, his hardships and endurance, is one of the classics of criminology. Fabian was glad when, after his sentence of three months was done, Eddie Guerin came to see him again at Vine Street. The old man looked a little paler and, if possible, a little thinner. Fabian took him for a meal and watched him as he cautiously tackled the plate of bacon and eggs. What, uh, what made you come to see me, Eddie? Oh, I don't know. I, I was just wondering if maybe you didn't owe me a drink, Mr. Fabian, after putting me in for that stretch. Yes, perhaps I do. 
But a meal will do you more good than a drink. Mm, I suppose so. Why don't you give it up, Eddie? You've got a good story behind you. You could sell it to a magazine or a newspaper, and that would give you a lump sum of money to make a new start. Do you suppose I could have a beer, Mr. Fabian? <laughs> Why not? Waiter, let's have a bottle of beer, would you? What about it, Eddie? Why don't you get a job? You're a queer kind of boy to talk like that. How old are you? 27. Well, I'm 68. They don't give you jobs when you're that age. And when you've got a record like mine. Oh, yes, Ben. Thank you. I've got no family, you see, Mr. Fabian. At least none to live with. Wherever I go, I'm alone. I've got no trade, only crime. But I don't want to die in prison, son. Would you? There's only one answer to that. Yeah, have a drink. Thanks. Funny, isn't it? The first drink you have after you get out of prison. There's nothing like it in this whole world. Look, Eddie, I think I can help you to sell the story of yours. I know people who pay good money for it. Uh, it's no good, Mr. Fabian. I can't do it. There'd be reprisals. Oh, not against you, Eddie. The French can't touch you in England. No, no, it's not that. You see, there's a girl. She's still there in that damned green frying pan. They could get at her and hurt her, too. You know what they do? They chain your wrists and ankles. They put you in a steel cell in the steel corridor on the French prison train. It shunts and jolts all over France from jail to jail until it's filled with men. Or women. Women, too, eh? Yes, yes, they used to send women. They sent a girl named Thomasine. She was 23 years old. Can you imagine that? Pretty grim, isn't it? Then you march, chained in batches of four to the little seaport where the prison ship waits. You go below in the steel cages. Fifty men to each cage. At first, they're hazy with steam, and you wonder why. Well, the warders have been testing the steam pipes. They can squirt scalding steam into those cages, stew the meat off your bones at the first sign of a riot. Eddie, let's not talk about it. Wait until you're feeling better, eh? Yeah, it doesn't make you feel very human. The voyage goes on about three weeks. One hour on deck each day, that's all. At night, men twitch and cry in their sleep. It's funny. By the inspection lamp, you can see big-bearded men fast asleep with tears running out of their shut eyes. Some men go overboard during exercise hour. They don't stop the ship. The warders just shrug. He's better where he is, they say. That's encouraging, isn't it? Fabian murmured something, but the old man didn't seem to hear. His eyes were nearly closed, his mind making that painful journey back through time. The cracked voice took on a new vibrant quality as it told of the mainland prison in French Guiana, of the bit of rock out to sea known as Devil's Island, holding only about two dozen men, mostly political prisoners. Dreyfus had lived on the rock itself and had been liberated only two years before Guerin arrived. His hut, made of wood, driftwood and palm leaves, was still there. The warders had given Guerin some tools and said, You've got a week to build yourself a hut, my little brave one. If you can't do it, we'll find you a hole in the rock on St. Joseph Island. Mm, that was the worst place, that St. Joseph. Those holes. You couldn't quite stretch out full length. There was no sunlight, just a plank to sleep on. After a few weeks in darkness, your eyes get gummy and sore and sealed up. The insects were thick in them because they went off and cleaned out. I don't mean just mosquitoes, son. You understand? Sometimes poisonous centipedes two feet long. I've known men chuckle like kids on Christmas morning to find a giant centipede in the hole with them. They'd pick it up and flail themselves with it, then scream for the guard as the poison puffed out their skin like necklaces of red sausages. You see, that way they got a spell on the hospital island, St. Royal. How long were you on Devil's Island, Eddie? I couldn't say, son. A couple of years, maybe. I was well behaved. I didn't intend to stay there and rot to death. So at last they sent me to the mainland, to St. Laurent. 
On the edge of the jungle, on the Moroni River across the Dutch Guiana. Was that the escape route? Escape route? You've seen the alligator pool at London Zoo? Well, the Moroni River was like that. Shiny logs on red mud banks, except that when you rippled the water, those logs would blink their eyes and slide in after you. And beyond that was just jungle for 400 steady miles. Steady, Eddie, steady, old chap. Uh, yeah. Yes, you're quite right, son. It was all a long time ago. Let's forget it, eh? What's up? Eh? Oh, nothing, Sarge. I've just been talking to Eddie Gillen. Oh. Oh, I see. Makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah. What a story. He stole 40,000 pounds, and as a result, spent years in the hell they call Devil's Island. Now he's a broken old man, no use to himself or society. Yes. <laughs> And they laugh when you say crime doesn't pay. In a moment, you will hear from ex-superintendent Fabian a footnote to the story of the man who escaped from hell and something of our next story. And here is Mr. Fabian's footnote. On that day so many years ago when I talked with that old man, I think I came as near as any living man has been to extracting the true tale of the epic escape of Eddie Gearan from Devil's Island. Nobody knows the details of the escape, and nobody ever will, because Eddie himself died on December the 5th, 1940, in a public institution at Barry in Lancashire. He was 80 years old. Before he was evacuated to the country, he'd lived at a men's lodging house in Vauxhall District of London, drawing an old age pension. A sad ending for a man with strength enough to escape from hell. But speaking on the subject of crime not paying reminds me of another story in which fate stepped in with admirable irony to punish a criminal when the hands of the law were tied. I will tell you of this next week in the story of Coco Marquis. <laughs> 